Welcome to Atmos 5000 Day 20. We're focusing in on Chapter 7 of the Stoll Textbook, Sections 7.3 and 7.5, moving away from the condensation process on liquid droplets to the formation of ice crystals in clouds. Specifically, we'll be talking about the different types of ice nucleation and ice nuclei. We'll talk about the shapes of ice crystals. And then we'll introduce the concept of supercooled droplets and eventually get around to how these ice crystals grow and the uh, Werner Bergeron Venn Dyson process. So, ice nucleation can occur through one of several different uh, mechanisms. Uh, the first is homogeneous nucleation, where you have a a supercooled cloud droplet that spontaneously freezes without the presence of an ice nuclei. And this homogeneous nucleation uh, can only occur at temperatures of minus 40 degrees Celsius. So it's physically impossible for liquid water to exist at temperatures of colder than minus 40 degrees Celsius because the water molecules will spontaneously arrange themselves into a matrix uh, that will allow ice formation. A second ice nucleation process is called deposition, where you have an ice nucleus particle in the atmosphere, and water vapor will go through the process of deposition directly from the gas phase to the solid phase on top of the ice nuclei. A third version of ice nucleation can be immersion, where you have a particle uh, that was a, a cloud condensation nuclei, essentially, that was uh, formed as the basis of the formation of a droplet. And as that droplet cooled, one of the particles inside that droplet uh, will start to act as an ice nuclei. And in that case, you can actually freeze the droplet from the inside because you have this uh, ice nuclei inside the droplet. And the last form of ice nucleation that we're gonna be talking about here is contact nucleation, where you have a supercooled water droplet and it comes in physical contact with an ice nucleus. And then it will begin the freezing process around that ice nucleus on the outside of the droplet and will freeze inward. The best ice nucleus uh, in the world happens to be an ice crystal. Uh, but there are other particles uh, in the atmosphere that can act at, as ice nuclei uh, at temperatures colder than zero degrees C. So, as I said before, the best ice nuclei is ice, but other substances can act as ice nuclei if they have a similar molecular structure to ice. And Table 7.2 from the Stoll textbook uh, shows some of the species that have been identified as acting as ice nuclei in the atmosphere. And what this actually does is, let's just take a, a substance, a well-known substance called silver iodide. Uh, it has a uh, lot of structure that's not too dissimilar from ice. And so uh, <clears throat> if it happens to go through contact freezing, uh, number one, I guess on this one, it will have a it will act as an ice nuclei when the temperature of the droplet is minus three degrees Celsius. Uh, if it uh, is going through condensation freezing, um, then that would be minus four. If it's going through deposition, minus eight degrees C, and immersion freezing uh, would be minus 13. So the way that these are all determined is basically in the laboratory. Uh, it's an extremely difficult uh, process to determine uh, the ice nucleating capability of individual species because you have to basically uh, have a uh, very clean setup so that you're not contaminating it with other uh, species along the way. And I guess the, the takeaway message here is that the closer the molecular structure match, uh, the higher the temperature at which a substance will act as an ice nuclei. So let's just take, for example, down here at the bottom, kaolinite. Uh, kaolinite is a common uh, mineral, uh, geologic in origin, and uh, it has a wide range of 
temperatures at which it can act as an ice nuclei depending upon the uh, process. But if we just uh, look at contact freezing, uh, it can act as an ice nuclei at minus 5. And of the geological materials that are commonly found in the atmosphere, kaolinite has been shown to be the best ice nuclei. So, taking into account that the temperature has an impact on the number of ice nuclei, uh, that's not the only thing that controls the number of ice nuclei. Uh, the supersaturation also has an impact on which act as ice nuclei. If you increase the supersaturation, you will increase the number of species that can act as ice nuclei. So that's graphically depicted uh, in this uh, figure 7.10 from Stoll, where you can see that uh, the number of ice concentrations in number per cubic meter um, increases as you uh, move from uh, lower supersaturations to higher supersaturations, and it also increases as you move from higher temperatures to lower temperatures. So you'll have the most ice nuclei uh, at the combination of low temperature and high supersaturation, and you'll have the least number of ice nuclei at uh, high temperatures and low supersaturations. So here we're going to introduce the concept of ice crystal habits. And what that means is that depending upon the temperature and the supersaturation combination at which an ice crystal uh, embryo is formed, it will have a different lattice structure and therefore a different outward appearance. So on this chart, we have temperature on the x-axis and supersaturation on the y-axis. And then there is this water saturation curve uh, kind of in the middle of the chart, and that represents an atmosphere that is saturated with respect to water, so a 100% relative humidity. And that's the line that we're going to follow um, uh, initially in this conversation, and then we'll talk about what happens when the supersaturation uh, gets higher than the water saturation value. So let's start off between zero and minus four degrees Celsius. If an iceberg embryo forms in that temperature range at the water saturation level, it'll essentially form a hexagonal plate, uh, which is a six-sided plate that uh, has a width um, bigger than its uh, a height. Uh, if you move between about minus four and minus 10 degrees Celsius, you'll start to develop columns. And uh, these columns can be solid, uh, they can be hollow, uh, or eventually, uh, if the supersaturation increases enough, they can form what we call needles, which are extremely long and skinny. Um, <clears throat> and then, as we move between about minus 10 and minus 22 degrees Celsius, um, following the water saturation curve, you're now in the realm of the dendrites, which are essentially uh, hexagonal plates upon hexagonal plates. Those would be your sectored plates, uh, or you can have your true dendrites uh, at high supersaturations. And that's what people often draw when they think of snowflakes, but here we're talking about individual crystals. And then as you move even colder still, uh, colder than minus 22, you'll get back into the realm of the columns. Uh, and so it's really fascinating that the type of crystal um, preserves a history of where it formed in the cloud based upon the temperature and the supersaturation of the formation. And in general, the higher the supersaturation, the more complex the crystal structure actually becomes. So uh, if you look at the, rector, uh, the sector of the plates between minus 10 and minus 22, if you're at supersaturations below water, but still um, uh, have a relative humidity that's greater than 100% with respect to ice, you'll just get uh, boring solid plates. Um, but as you, the supersaturation increases, you start moving up into uh, more intricate thin plates, followed by sectored plates, followed by uh, full-blown dendrites. Um, so supersaturation has a big impact on the crystal habit as well. So 
it's really difficult to take pictures of individual crystals, uh, but this is actually a work that was done at UCLA. And uh, these are essentially impressions of ice crystals that were made in a polymer. And then they were able to photograph essentially the shadow or the impression that these ice crystals made in the polymer. So these are examples of hexagonal plates. Starting on the left, uh, you have a relatively simple hexagonal plate. In the center, you have a hexagonal plate with hexagonal uh, sectors on the, on the edges. We refer to that as a sectored plate. And then we have a uh, more complex crystal. That's a hexagonal plate that's got sectors on it and sectors on the sectors. And so it's actually starting to kind of resemble a dendrite, um, even though it's still kind of sectored plates. Here we have true dendrites. Uh, they are always have the six sides that's so common with the water molecule. And you essentially have branches growing off of each of the six spines associated with it. And the intricacy of the uh, six dendrite branches uh, depends upon the supersaturation of the environment. The more supersaturated it is, the more complex and the more beautiful the individual dendrite becomes. There are other types of ice crystals. In the top, we actually have a hollow column. Uh, in the bottom left, if you're a Star Wars fan, we could see that as a TIE fighter. But what that is, it's a hexagonal column in the center with uh, plates attached to each end. And that's fairly common. And then in the bottom right, we have a hexagonal column that actually has needles that are growing off of it. Um, and you can imagine that uh, the ice crystals are not always uh, completely separate from one another. They interact with each other and they can start to aggregate. Um, and eventually you'll get to a snowflake, which is composed of thousands of individual crystals. And so you can imagine that the old adage that no two snowflakes are the same is actually true because it is composed of uh, hundreds and thousands of individual ice crystals, all of which are slightly different from one another and arranged in a different way inside the snowflake itself. So the variety of ice crystals that uh, occur in nature is quite large. And this is figure 7.13 from uh, the Stoll textbook. And, you know, we've already talked, you know, some about the hexagonal plates and the the sectored plates and the um, dendrites, uh, but there's also some other uh, things that are fairly common. Um, we have bullets on row four, uh, and uh, we sometimes have uh, bullet rosettes where the bullets are actually uh, connected to each other at the center spine, that's in row three, column B. Uh, we have your capped columns, the TIE fighters at C3. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, as we move all the way over uh, to the right, uh, we have some, uh, essentially, some of the irregulars, uh, which are crystal fragments. Uh, and then uh, down in the bottom right on E6 and E7, we have what we refer to as rhymed uh, crystals, where you have supercooled droplets that have frozen to the exterior of an ice crystal through contact nucleation. And if you get enough rhymed uh, droplets uh, freezing on top of an ice crystal, you'll end up with a grapple particle. Uh, some people call grapple sleet. Uh, it's a amorphous shape uh, that is composed of uh, lots and lots of frozen supercooled water droplets on an ice embryo. It's uh, typically milky white and kind of spongy. Uh, and when you have a thunderstorm and when you first start hearing ice, you know, pelting the windows, it's typically grapple that's coming out of the cloud. And it's basically grapple is a hail embryo. Uh, it's not really hail, but uh, could theoretically turn into hail if it's processed in the cloud in the proper way. So what are these super cool droplets that we keep talking about? Well, it's liquid water that exists uh, at temperatures between zero degrees Celsius and minus 40 degrees Celsius.
And you kind of think about this, it's kind of odd. Uh, if I fill up an ice cube tray with water and I stick it in my freezer uh, and I come back 12 hours later, I don't expect the water to still be liquid. I expect it to be frozen. Um, and that's because, you know, there's plenty of ice nuclei in the water or the tray itself can act as an ice nuclei. But when you divide that water up into thousands and thousands of individual small cloud droplets, each of those cloud droplets uh, may or may not have an ice nuclei. In fact, the, the more droplets you get and the smaller they become, the less likely it is that they'll actually have an ice nuclei. And because ice nuclei are rare, supercooled droplets are actually uh, very common. Uh, and so the supercooled droplets are most commonly observed in clouds with temperatures between zero degrees Celsius and minus 20 degrees Celsius. Because as you get uh, below minus 20, most of the particles in the atmosphere or many of the particles in the atmosphere will start to act as ice nuclei because you don't have to have a great match to the uh, lattice structure of ice in order for particles to start to act as ice nuclei as the temperatures get colder and colder. So precipitation formation in mixed phase clouds. So we often refer to warm clouds as clouds that don't have ice. Mixed phase clouds are clouds that have both water and liquid water and ice in them. And the thing about mixed phase clouds is that growth by condensation occurs in all clouds, regardless of whether or not it's warm or mixed phase or glaciated, which would be completely ice covered. Um, but growth by collision coalescence, which we haven't really talked about in detail yet, occurs in all clouds uh, that are liquid and that have liquid in them. And growth by deposition of water vapor can only occur in clouds that contain ice. Um, so mixed phase clouds uh, have essentially three different growth mechanisms. The, the, the hydrometeors can grow by condensation, by collision coalescence, and by vapor deposition. And that's why mixed phase clouds uh, almost always precipitate. So here's an example of growth by vapor deposition. Here, the black dots are particles in the atmosphere. Uh, we happen to have hexagonal plates, which are ice crystals. And both of these are superimposed on a background of water vapor molecules. Uh, let's assume here that for vapor deposition to occur, the uh, environment has to be supersaturated with respect to ice. And if the environment is supersaturated with respect to ice, then the water vapor molecules will deposit directly on the uh, ice crystals through the process of vapor deposition. So let's see what that looks like. And the vapor deposition uh, occurs faster than vapor condensation would for liquid droplets, which means that these ice, the rate of growth of these ice crystals is actually quite large. So another mechanism uh, is deposition and condensation. They have to compete for the available water vapor. So here we have a mixed phase cloud. We have our particles, which are not activated cloud droplets, they just are, are particles or haze droplets. We have uh, cloud droplets, uh, the larger droplets in blue, and then we have ice crystals. And because the ice crystals are supersaturated with respect to ice, uh, there's a higher supersaturation around the ice crystals than there are around the water droplets. So the ice crystals will grow faster uh, and will start to scavenge the water vapor from the environment and that will cause the uh, liquid droplets to evaporate uh, in order to feed the, to replace the water vapor which is being removed quickly from the atmosphere uh, onto the ice crystals. And so after a short period of time, all of the liquid water droplets will have evaporated um, and deposited that water vapor into the atmosphere which then goes onto the ice crystals themselves.
So here's what that looks like. So the end result is you end up with a few large ice crystals and the water droplets have essentially evaporated back down to haze droplets and they've contributed their water to the uh, growth of the ice crystals. We refer to this as the Werner Bergeron Findeisen process. Uh, it occurs in mixed phase clouds. Those ice crystals grow much more rapidly than the water droplets and the vapor depletion occurs near the ice and the water droplets evaporate to replace the vapor. The ice crystals continue to grow and water droplets disappear, uh, summarizing what was in the previous slide. And the uh, Werner Bergeron Findeisen process is the primary mechanism by which uh, mixed phase clouds actually uh, grow hydrometeors to the size in which they can precipitate.